Welcome to Dayspring Fellowship. Can you believe it's already 2023? We all get a fresh start. A clean slate just waiting to write our story. And how exciting is it that your 2023 story begins right here, in this moment, investing in the most important relationship in your life, whether you know it or not. So are you ready for what God has for you today? Whether you are in the room live, watching online or later on demand, I know one thing for sure. God wants to take center stage in your story as he births something new in you. Oh, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. I can't wait to see what he does in your life and my life for that matter. I'm Chris Voigt and I lead the team here at Dayspring. People grow here because God uses the people on our team to challenge, encourage, and equip people to become more like Jesus. If you are just visiting today, we want you to know that you can come as you. We're just like you, regular people on a journey discovering what God has for us each day, and each day saying yes to becoming like Jesus, one step at a time. Which means that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, this is a good place to figure out what your yes is today, and tomorrow, and the next day. Slowly becoming like Jesus, we haven't arrived yet, so we can be good company on the journey. Even if you aren't sure the Christian life is a journey you want to be on, this is a good place to ask questions as you look for answers. So welcome. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page, or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your home church, or if you just have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find a discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. And now, let's join our service. One of the things I enjoy about the whole Christmas season is that it's filled with hope. I'm an eternal optimist. I like hope. And, and it seems like hope is in short supply most of the year. So I always look forward to December. And of course, Jesus' birth is the hope of all hopes. But, this, but all December, there is this building sense of hope for the new year as we wrap up the old one. And I think it's kind of cool that January 1st is on Sunday this year. It feels like we have a clean slate and we're starting the year off on the right foot. I had my quiet time this morning, so I can say that I haven't missed a day in the Word of God all year long. Yeah, Dee Dee was still asleep when I left home to come to church, so um, I, I, our relationship is still going great this year. If I keep this up, it's gonna be a good year. I have hope. It's almost lunchtime, and I haven't messed up yet. You know, for more than 30 years, my role in church has meant that I'm always looking forward because Sunday comes every seven days, whether I'm ready or not. And as soon as this service is over, all of my attention will shift to next Sunday. And next Sunday will take most of my attention for this week. It's a continuous rhythm that my life revolves around, which I don't mind most of the time. The, the continuous routine has helped me develop some really good spiritual habits through the years. The biggest challenge of always looking uh, forward to next Sunday is that unless I'm very intentional, it's easy to forget what happened last Sunday. Unless I'm intentional, there's very little room for reflection. Uh, one of the repeated instructions that we see in Scripture is to remember. Uh, Psalm 119.55 says this, I reflect at night on who you are, O Lord. Therefore, I obey your instructions. Uh, we, we reflect on or remember who God is, which leads us to more faithfully living in alignment with who we are called to become. King David in Psalm 103.2 writes this about remembering. He says, let all that I am, praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. The New International Version says to forget not all his benefits. So while Psalm 119 instructed us to remember who God 
is, David is telling us to also remember what God has done for you, how he has shown up in your life, how he has met your needs in the past. Remember his faithfulness to you. If remembering who God is leads us to living more faithfully for him, then remembering what he has done for you leads to more faith in him. Remembering how he provided the last time your bank account was running on empty reminds you to trust in his continued faithfulness toward you. One more. This one way back in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 2. Here this big Jewish family who had become a great nation during their 40-year journey through the desert were instructed to remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. So here, remember that there is purpose in everything you go through, good and bad. God is testing you, training you, preparing you, aligning you as he leads you. There are lessons along the way. Lessons that are important to remember, to reflect on. Lessons that you don't want to miss because God never graduates you to the next level until you've passed the one you're on. As he makes us more like Jesus. All of this to say, unless I am very intentional, my forward-looking life forgets to remember because Sunday comes every seven days whether I'm ready or not. Robert Robinson, who gave us one of the great hymns of our faith, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, almost 300 years ago, penned these words in verse 2. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Uh, did anyone bring their Ebenezer with them this morning? Anyone? Some of you are thinking, what does Scrooge have to do with anything? It's clearly an old term that has fallen out of use. Gee, I wonder why. It comes from an Old Testament image of a, of a, to plant a staff of, or stake of remembrance in the ground. Basically a fancy way of saying, remember what God has done. So I started something a few years ago that has become a bit of a tradition here at Dayspring. And Ebenezer of sorts, at least for me. The last Sunday of the year, or in this case, the first Sunday of this year, we take a look back at what God has taught us as a church this year. What are some of the lessons that we should remember as we move into the new year? Now, since I know that you forget everything I say about 10 minutes after each service, let's just remind ourselves what we did cover in 2022. Uh, because our identity is under constant assault from our enemy through our culture, sometimes from each other and even from our own selves, we began the year with a series we called Lies We Believe in the Truth That Sets Us Free. Using Dr. Chris Thurman's book, Lies We Believe, as our launching point, we worked our way through 13, and there are many more than just 13, but you've got to start somewhere, 13 of the most damaging lies that trip us up and get in the way of us entering into all of the blessing that God has for us. Lies that keep us distracted from becoming more like Jesus. Truth has far more power than lies. So we focused on replacing those lies with truth. And what you see here in this illustration are the 13 truths we covered. In order to become a spiritually and emotionally healthy Christ follower, our identity must be firmly rooted in God's truth. From there, we moved to the Gospel of John. Now, who doesn't like a good gospel? And John has given us what is arguably the one, the one of the top four of all time. But, but before we take a look at a few verses in John, right smack in the middle of that series, a little event we like to call Easter came upon us. So we pushed pause on John to get ready for Easter in our series, The Bad Boys of Easter. And in it, we looked at the story of Caiaphas, the high priest who had too much to lose to follow Jesus. And then we looked at Judas Iscariot, who just couldn't seem to get Jesus to do what he wanted Jesus to do the way he wanted Jesus to do it. And then we looked at one of the unnamed criminals who spent the last moments of his life on a cross 12 feet away from Jesus. 
A man who finally understood in those last moments that not all was as it seemed, that God's thoughts about us are not reflected in our circumstances. And then back to John. And while we were in John, we came across these great verses in chapter 15 that kind of became a theme for the year. John writes that Jesus said in verse 9, beginning in verse 9, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Now, we said this, we, we did this a lot together this summer, so let's just say it all together. Verse 12, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Now, these are very familiar words to most of us, even before this last summer. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. This is my commandment. Jesus left us with only one commandment. We are to love others like Jesus loved, like Jesus loves us. Now, if we can get this one right, we don't need the Ten Commandments or any of the other 605 commands of the Old Testament. Loving like Jesus is the super command that trumps them all. In any and every situation, we need only ask one question. What does love require of me in this moment? And then do that. So easy and so hard. <laughs> But it was this kind of love that changed the world in the first century. This kind of love that gave value and worth to every person. Slaves had value. Women had value. Babies had value. This kind of love led the first century Christians to go out into the forest looking for abandoned babies, most of whom were girls or disabled in some way. And they took them in and gave them a family. This kind of love led those same people to minister to the sick, the broken, the needy in a way that the world had never experienced before. And it changed the world. And it's this kind of love that will change the world today. Now, though we wouldn't have the language to put it this way until fall, this is one of our highest group values here at Dayspring. Our group identity is this. We are a people who love others the way Jesus loves us. And we spent the summer exploring what that means, what it means to love like Jesus in different contexts. We, we live in a world that is moving in the opposite direction of the ways of God, which gives us some really good opportunities to contrast, to show the world Jesus so after John, we explored biblical peace. We are clearly living in a world without peace. And even as Christ followers, it is easy to look at our external circumstances and get all wonky on the inside as we forget that biblical peace comes from within, not from without. We too often allow our circumstances to rob us of our peace. But biblical peace exists regardless of our circumstances, in the fiercest of storms, because God gives us peace. Peace is one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives the followers of Jesus. Because of our relationship with Jesus, we are at peace with God, who gives us peace within ourselves, regardless of our circumstances, and peace with others. We have this kind of peace that the world is really looking for. So as Christ followers, as people who love others the way Jesus loved us, we are called to be ambassadors of peace. And then in July, we looked at what love requires in the context of relationships. Though we focused on dating relationships, the principles we explored applied to all of us, married or not. So instead of looking for Mr. or Miss Wright, which is how the world focuses their dating, the, the world looks for the perfect person to complete me. But God's ways are not our ways, and the world's ways are the opposite of God's ways. So instead of looking for Mr. or Miss Right, 
We looked at becoming the person that our Mr. or Miss Wright is hoping and praying for. And for those of us already married, we asked the question, are you the person that your person was hoping and praying for? And if not, well then why not? And then we looked at the, the fine print as provided by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which was pretty helpful for all of us because 1 Corinthians chapter 13 gives us some really practical teaching about what love looks like in every circumstance. Uh, uh, and uh, since we are all trying to love others like Jesus loved us, whether we are married or not, there was a lot of good help for all of us. There was more, of course. We talked about dating in a different direction and how to, to uh, process heartbreaks. But from there, we spent August looking at what love requires of us with our words. Words have power. They have the power to give life as they bring joy and laughter and as they build up and encourage. And they have the power to take life, making someone feel small, less than. To make them believe that they're not enough, that they'll never be enough. And since we've all been on the giving and receiving end of those kinds of words... We know just how much carnage those kinds of words leave in their wake. Damage that can last a lifetime. But we aren't those kind of people. Since we take our cues from Jesus, love requires that we use our words to honor him and others in any and every situation. In any and every situation, there is a God-honoring way to communicate truth. And we spent August looking at how to do just that which we all need to excel at because the ability to measure our words is one of the best, most tangible indicators of spiritual maturity, which gives us a target to aim toward. Bringing us up to September. In September, we added some depth and texture to what it means to love like Jesus in our series, Wired, Brain Science and Spiritual Growth. Now, I'm going to lay all of my cards on the table as I tell you that I believe this is arguably the most important series we've ever done. If we can integrate what we learned in this five-week series with our discipleship strategy, we'll see no end to spiritual growth in all of our lives. I guess it will take us a couple of years to get to that point as an organization, but individually, you don't have to wait for that. We can all apply these lessons to our lives right now. The really smart people who study how the brain works have unlocked some really cool mysteries that show us exactly how the brain processes spiritual formation, how we actually become like Jesus. In a nutshell, everything that enters the brain, everything enters the brain on the back right side, processes to the front right side before crossing over to the left front side and then finally to the back left side. Which means that the right side of the brain, which operates at six times per second as compared to the left side's five times per second, the right side accesses everything before the left side of the brain is even aware that anything is going on. Before the left brain can analyze anything, it is already operating in the past. And the right brain is always operating on instinct in the present. Spiritual formation, which is simply the process of aligning our instincts with the character of Jesus, happens on the, the right side of the brain, not the left. And for hundreds of years, we've had it wrong. We thought that more information about God, which is left brain processing, left brain functioning, was enough for spiritual formation. And it turns out that isn't true. The left side is certainly still very important, and we need good information about God. But information doesn't change our heart, doesn't change our instincts. And here's the proof. How many times have you sinned knowing before you sinned that it was a sin? Almost 100% of the time, I'd guess. You see, you had the information, but it didn't change your actions. The bottom line, when we become like Jesus, we, we become like Jesus when our spiritual formation is right brain driven. If this doesn't make sense, go back and watch the series again. It was a lot of information to narrow down to just a few paragraphs. Spiritual formation occurs when four things are present. First, 
the gateway to all spiritual growth is joy. Joy is a right brain super emotion. Joy defined as what, what you feel, what happens in your body when someone's face lights up because they are happy to be with you. Joy opens the door for spiritual growth, which is then driven by love. Love is the primary shaper of character growth. So the second thing we need for spiritual formation is deep loving relationships. The kind of relationships that in Hebrew would be the word hesed. In Greek, the word that translators have chosen is the highest form of love in Greek. And they have like nine ways to describe different expressions of love. But we know that the highest, we know the highest form as agape. Hesed relationships, agape, are deeply rooted doing life together in love relationships. Now what's interesting is if we go back to our verses in the Gospel of John for a moment. Jesus said, I have loved. In Greek, the word is agapau, which is just a different form of agape. I have agapowed you, even as the Father has agapowed me. Remain in my love. Remain in my agape. When you obey my commandments, underline this verse or highlight this verse if you're following along in your Bible. This is important. In a second, this is going to come full circle. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and I remain in His love. I have told you these things so, your joy, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Okay, so here we are back again at the we remain in his love when we obey his commandments. This is my commandment. Love or agapow each other in the same way I have agapowed you. Okay, so what? What does this mean? Well, in the original language, this paints a different picture of what it means to remain in Jesus than we're used to. We think that to remain in Jesus is just a me and Jesus kind of a thing. But hesed in Hebrew and agape or agapao in Greek, uh, they are experienced in community. We remain in Jesus when we love the way Jesus loved us. In fact, if we want to become like Jesus, biblical hesed community is non-negotiable. We can only fully become like Jesus with each other. Now, the third thing we need for spiritual formation is a strong group identity. We are a people who love others the way Jesus loved us, is a group identity statement. When that becomes fully integrated into our DNA, it sets the bar for what we are all aiming for. Another one is that for us, for us here at Day Spring, another one is that people grow here. That's just who we are. We grow spiritually. If you don't want to grow spiritually, that's all right with us. But we're probably not the best church for you. The fourth thing we need for spiritual formation is biblical shame. Not the toxic shame that we are all more familiar with, but biblical shame. We need to have the depth of relationship with each other where we can say, Hey, Chris, I think you've forgotten who you are when I mess up. Again, I think this would be a good series for everyone to go back and binge watch. It's better for you than anything on Netflix. <laughs> but, but here's the richness that this layer added to our loving like Jesus. Our group identity statement becomes this. People grow here together. I don't grow alone. I grow with you. You grow with me and even more each other. The person on your left, the person on your right, the person in front of you and behind you. We are all in this together because we are the church, which leads us to Ephesians. When we surrender our lives to Christ, some really cool things happen, things that take us years to really wrap our heads around. We immediately become citizens of the kingdom of God, which comes with rights and responsibilities. God himself, in the person of the Holy Spirit, backs a U-Haul up to our heart and moves in. His presence is the down payment of our new standing with God, our inheritance. 
Because we aren't just ordinary citizens of the kingdom of God. We have been adopted into God's family. As we become more like Jesus, he makes himself more and more home. Uh, he um, more, more and more at home. He unpacks, so to speak. The more comfortable we make him, the more power he lends us to live a righteous life as we live out our calling, doing the things that God prepared for us to do before time began. With our new citizenship comes membership in the capital C Church, the body of Christ. And it is only in the body of Christ that our little temples of God find their full expression as the temple of God. And we make Christ visible to a lost and broken world. Again, we, doing life together, becoming like Jesus together, changing the world together, we reveal the full expression of Jesus to the world. Now, all of that happens immediately, though, as I said, it takes a lifetime to really wrap your, your life around this new identity, which would be easier if our identity weren't under constant assault by Satan and his minions, who work tirelessly to stop the movement of Christ in us and through us. Even though they've lost the war, they still fight to undermine Christ's work. But God has given us his armor to protect us and to fight with. Although, as I saw on Instagram this week, too many Christians are streakers. They run around wearing only the helmet of salvation thinking that is enough. Okay, that was funnier than that. Seriously, though, while we came to Ephesians to strengthen our understanding of who we are in Christ and why that matters, Paul also affirmed our connectedness to one another. We grow together. No man is an island, and your church family is crucial to your spiritual journey, which also means you are critical to other people's journeys. The capital C Church and our expression of it here at Dayspring need you. You are vital to the work of God through this, this body of believers, whether you think so or not. And not only that, all of creation, the angels and the demons and who knows who else, are watching the wisdom of God as it unfolds through the church. None of them saw it coming. We have the incredible privilege of making God look wise. Not that he needs us for that, but the rest of the heavenlies apparently do. So let's make him look good, church. And then last but not least, we had Christmas. And since we just had Christmas, I'll leave it at that. Now, here we are at the first of a new year. Anything is possible. No matter how your spiritual journey went in 2022, anything is possible this year. The page is blank, and you get to write a new chapter in your story. But that doesn't mean that we want to miss the lessons God had for us last year. If we don't spend some time remembering, we may be doomed to repeat some things we don't really want to repeat. Because God doesn't graduate us to the next level until we've passed the one we're on. So let's consider this our final exam of sorts. Now, I'm going to transition to the piano, and as I do, I want to invite you to consider the past year. Uh, how are you different today than you were January 1st, 2022? How have you grown? What was Jesus trying to teach you this past year? Did you learn the lesson? Do you love more like Jesus today than you did a year ago? Are you more deeply rooted in the body of Christ? Are, are you still lone rangering your spiritual journey? You might want to jot down a few notes on the message notes in the bulletins so that you can come back to them later. If your mind goes blank, like mine usually does when someone puts me on the spot, just pray that God will lead you to those lessons as you think through the past year. Now, once I get to the piano, I'll noodle for a bit to give you some time to process. That way, those watching online will know that we haven't lost sound. And, and then for the rest of the service, here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship and pray and worship and pray before we share in communion together. So make yourself comfortable 
and spend some time reflecting on your spiritual journey this past year. Thank you for joining us today. Let me encourage you to download the discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. Working through those questions, alone or with others, will help the truth of God's Word find its place in your life. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen, or you can call the church during the week. Faithful people like you make this ministry possible. People who believe in what God is doing through Dayspring, who have experienced God's work in and through their own lives and been changed in the process. If you're just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. That is the responsibility of our Dayspringers. We are simply excited to play a small part as God does His perfect work in you today. For those of you who would like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. Please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. And one more thing, thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you connect with us. Thank you for rating us where that is appropriate. Even more, thank you for sharing our services with your friends and family. God uses you to plant seeds in other people's lives. So keep sowing. And if this service was a blessing to you, it'll probably be a blessing to someone else too. Until we meet again, I am praying God's richest blessings would overflow in and through your life.